Think of that person who hurt you. Think of that person who is making really, really bad choices. And then ask yourself, if they were in trouble, would I actually help them? Today we're going to see a rescue story where Abraham rescues his wayward nephew Lot. And today we're going to be reminded that when it comes to rescuing people, we're supposed to do what we can, and then we have to leave the rest up to God. Good morning. Welcome to our Women's Bible Study. Super glad you are joining us today. Uh, We are working through a series in the book of Genesis, and um, we are on actually Genesis lesson 31. So we've made it to Genesis 14 today. Now today we're going to see the actual first war that's ever mentioned in the Bible. And through this, we're going to learn a couple lessons, one being that God is really, really powerful. So let's talk about rescue. I want to tell you a story. In 1995, NATO decided to intervene in the Bosnian War. On the ground, a Bosnian Serb um, army fired a, here you go, surface-to-air missile, and the Serbs laid a trap. They switched on their missile radar sparingly, giving the F-16, here's our F-16, oh, I didn't have a picture in there, F-16 fighters little warning. So they waited until a plane was directly overhead and they fired two missiles. They fired the two missiles to one of the F-16s where in the cockpit was Scott O'Grady. His instruments alerted him that a missile was coming, but because he was flying through overcast sky, he couldn't see it. So the first missile exploded between his aircraft and uh, another guy there is the F-16, and the second one actually struck his plane. Captain Robert Gordon, who was the, another plane that was up there, saw O'Grady's plane burst into flames, break into, and he never saw a parachute. So he didn't think Grady actually made it out alive, but he actually did. O'Grady landed among a Bosnian Serb population. He was, he, he was told originally, if you, something happens and you end up in this territory, this is going to be a really bad deal for you because uh, it would be very unfriendly for anyone to know that you're there. So he quickly secured a 29-pound survival bag. He ran and he hid. Rubbing dirt on his face, he hid face down as Bosnian Serb forces came upon his parachute. Half a dozen times, they started shooting their rifles, only, you know, hoping that where, he, hoping that in the bushes where he was and where he was hiding, that they would flush him out or they would kill him, one or the other. They didn't exactly know where he was. During the next six days, he ate leaves, grass, bugs, stored a little rainwater in a sponge so he could have something to drink. He radioed for help immediately, but then he had to remain quiet for the mo- majority of the time because there was too many enemies around him. On his sixth night on the ground, he made radio contact signaling his location using his radio's limited battery power. NATO planes began picking up these beeper snippets that they thought could possibly be coming from O'Grady. So on June 8th, the helicopters decided to go in and rescue him. They, they figured out where his signal beacon had, was coming from. And as they got close, O'Grady had set off a flare. The helicopter first touched down. 20 Marines jumped out, sent a defensive a perimeter around, around the helicopter. The second helicopter landed, and O'Grady appeared running towards the Marines, and he immediately jumped into the helicopter. That entire rescue took seven minutes. Now, that was an amazing rescue. And what was interesting is that on a rescue like this, it makes sense. Because these guys had each other's backs. They're military. They're brothers in arms. That's just what they did. But the difference between them and this rescue and this this story today, this rescue between Abraham rescuing Lot is that Scott O'Grady never moved to Sodom, okay? Scott O'Grady didn't make bad decisions. He didn't go, you know, to a Serbian bar and get drunk one day. He didn't get in a bar fight with the enemy. 
Scott did everything right. He trained, he flew fighter jets, he was protecting people, and he was rescued because he did something really good. But today's rescue story is going to feel a little different because Lot was going to get rescued even though he did everything in his life wrong. At this point, Abraham is making a home in his new land we know of Israel. It's right behind us on the screen here. It's what it, that is Israel. That's the Dead Sea. That, this is the, ter- the terrain of what Abraham would have lived in. Um, but Abraham follows God with all of his heart. Last week we saw that Lot, Abraham's nephew, went to a different direction. He decided to move towards Sodom, a wicked, evil city. He pitched his tent there, he got too close, and then he eventually moved there. But as we see today, Lot had a choice. He could have gone to Sodom and seen all of this corruption and said, you know what, I can't do this anymore. I'm moving my family back with Abraham. He could have realized, like, I need to make my life a place, or, or my life to where I can, you know, tell others about this awesome God. But he didn't. He went to Sodom, and the farther he went into Sodom, the farther he went away from God. And all Abraham could do would be to watch from a distant, distance. But then something happens, and Lot gets in trouble. Now, for some of you, you get this. You have children who did just what Lot did. You raise them to follow Jesus, you raise them to know the truth, but they got caught up in this wrong crowd. They started doing drugs, they they lost everything, they couldn't work, they don't have money, they can't, nothing, nothing's working with them. And now they're in jail. And they get, you get a phone call, hey, would you bail me out? They want you to rescue them after everything that they've done wrong. And the first thought in your mind is, why would I do that? Like, you made your bed, you can lie in it. You made a mess of your life. There are consequences to that. And I wonder if Abraham ever felt that way about Lot. Because today, Lot's in a lot of trouble. Because of the town he lives in is in a lot of trouble. And had Lot not moved to Sodom, he wouldn't even have been caught up in any of this. And so what we're going to see is and read is the first war written in the Bible. The first 12 verses are going to set this up for us. Genesis 14. It came to pass in the days of Amraphel, king of Shinar. Now, right off the bat, I'm going to point to you modern-day places. Shinar is modern-day Iraq, Babylon. Okay, so think about, think Middle East, think of Iran or Iraq. Arioch, king of Elisar, he's also from Iraq. Ketelamir, king of Elam, which is modern-day Iran. And then the title king of Goim, most people think is possibly Syria. So if you look at this map, you can see little baby Israel over there, right under Lebanon. You see Israel, it's a little strip. See Syria, Iraq, Iran. So now you have four powerful kings of the east, and they're about ready to come into Israel and pretty much wreak havoc on them. Here's another picture of this. You can see this. These are the four kings right there, and that's kind of the the general vicinity of where they're at, and they're all going to come over to them. So you've got four kings, and they're going to go to war with five kings in Israel. Look who these guys are. So they went to war against Bera, king of who? Sodom. Yay, Lot. Bersha, king of Gomorrah. Shineb, king of Adma. Shember, king of Zeboim. And the king of Bela, that is Zoar. So here is a picture. We showed this to you the last lesson. You see down at the bottom down there, you see Zoar. You see Sodom, you see Gomorrah. So you see that they're coming, the, the, the kings of the east are coming down. Here's another picture. The kings of the east are coming way from the top, the north of, of Israel. They're coming down. This is the king's highway where you see on the right. It's a very, very important highway, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, so they're gonna, and, and as they're coming along, they're just wiping out all these cities. And, and they're heading down towards Sodom and Gomorrah. All these uh, latter kings joined forces in the Valley of Siddim, the Salt Sea. So in this area, this little area down here, the the Salt Sea or the Dead Sea, it's right in this particular area that all this is is going on. For 12 years, this is the reason why this was a problem. For 12 years, they had been subject, all these kings in Israel, to Ketelamir, 
But in the 13th year, they rebelled. So they're like, and I don't know, maybe it was a tax thing, like you have to pay the kings of the east all these taxes or whatever because of this king's highway. I don't know exactly, but whatever it was, they're like, the people in Israel are like, all done, we're not doing that anymore. So they're coming up against these kings, and the kings are like, yep, that's not going to work for us. Let's read this, and it'll give you a better idea. On the surface... This war is merely an international power struggle to control a strategic commercial land bridge between Mesopotamia and Egypt. Whoever controlled this land bridge maintained a monopoly on international trade. The King's Highway was the most important north-south biblical trading route that existed east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Caravans conveyed spices, perfumes, precious stones, cattle, and other goods from the Arabian Peninsula along this route. You can read that in Kings and Ezekiel. Important minerals such as copper and iron mined between the Dead Sea and the Gulf of Aqaba were also transported along this ancient thoroughfare. Sodom and Gomorrah were important trading centers on the north-south route along the Jordan Valley linking Edom and Arabia in the south to Damascus and Mesopotamia in the north. Like many cities crowded with numerous foreign merchants and businessmen, it was a notorious place of loose morals and decadence. I don't know if we saw that. Sodom and Gomorrah, here you go. Sodom and Gomorrah were important trading centers on the north-south route. Um, Now, think about that. that. It makes sense now. Like, why in the world was Sodom and Gomorrah so evil and wicked? And now it makes sense because you see here that, that they were, it was a, t- a center for all these foreign different people. So, so that we kind of go, okay, that makes sense now. Um, like many cities crowded uh, with foreign merchants and businessmen, it was a notorious place of loose morals and decadence. Its reputation as the sin city of its day has long lived on after its own destruction. So, the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah decide we're going to stand up to the kings of the east. And in response to the five kings wanting to rebel, these eastern kings lost, launched this huge attack to stop this re- rebellion. Verse 5, in the 14th year, Ketelmir and the kings allied with him went out and defeated, and it gives this long list of people who, who they defeated. These are all people in, in Israel as they were coming down. Then they turned back and went in and Mishpah, that is Kadesh, and they conquered the whole territory, the Amalekites, the Amorites, and all that. Uh, Then the king of Sodom, the king of Gomorrah, the king of Adma, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that's the Lord, marched out and drew up their battle lines in the valley of Siddim. So this area right here, they decide, you know what, we're not going to let these kings win. Get our armies together. We're going to get our battle lines together. They're not getting through. But... Here was the problem. Um, Those are the kings they went against. But look at verse 10. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits. I don't think I wrote what a tar pit was. Here's a picture of one. Um, A tar pit forms when the oils seep up from the surface of the earth's crust. And the lighter part evaporates so that what's left is this sticky asphalt yucky stuff. Uh, this is a picture in um, Los Angeles. There's one called La Brea. And it's kind of interesting. Think about, they find lots of fossils in these things because they're so sticky. And like, so when, when let's, say, let's say an extinct animal falls into it, you know, and then it's, they, they find these things. It's kind of interesting. But apparently in this area around here, uh, the Dead Sea, uh, this particular area was filled with these kind of tar pits. Here's another picture of the sticky, yucky, yucky stuff that, that's there. But the king of Sodom and Gomorrah did something. Remember the cartoon Peanuts with Linus? One of the scenes, Linus and Charlie Brown are walking along and chatting, and Linus says this, I don't like to face problems head on. He says, I think the best way to solve problems is just to avoid them. (laughs) In fact, he says, this is a distinct philosophy of mine. No problem is so big or so complicated that it can't be run away from. Okay, so I think the king of Sodom and Gomorrah took Linus's advice, okay, because they suddenly saw this army coming, and we see here when the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, okay, they took off and ran. Some of them fell into the rest, uh, fell into them, which is the tar pits, and the rest fled to the hills. You can see this hills here, like, you know, they, they all ran. Some of them fell into the tar pits. Now, here's the problem. The four kings from the east seized all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their food. Then they went away. They also carried off Abram's nephew, Lot, 
and his possessions since he was what? Living in Sodom now. Way to go, Lot. Last week we saw that. He moved there. Now we see this in, in, in the Bible. So they haul away Lot and all these people and everything. And then we see this. You see them, they came down, they went down the Dead Sea, they came back up and they go take them all the way up to way, way, way the northern part of Israel. Verse 13 says this. One who had escaped came and reported this to Abram, the Hebrew. Now Abram was living near the great trees of Mamre, the Amorite, the brother of Eschol and Anner, all of whom were allied with Abram. Now, someone comes to Abram. Oh my gosh, you're not going to believe what just happened. The kings of the east, they showed up. They took your nephew Lot. They, they've hauled him away. Now, you would expect Abraham to say what we say. Well, that's too bad for him. Too bad, too sad. So sorry. It's consequences. He moved to Sodom. That was his choice. Can't help him out. You'd expect him to say that. But that's not what he does. Look at verse 14. When Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he called out the 318 trained men born in his household and went in pursuit as far as Dan. Dan is the farthest northern place you can get in Israel. Um, and this tells us a little bit about Abraham. We think of him as a nomad shepherd. We just think of him wandering around the desert with his little headpiece on and his sheep and whatever. But it sounds like Abraham's a lot more than that. It sounds like he knew that he lived in a land that was very, very wicked, wickedness all around him. And so he prepared the men in his household in case something bad ever happened just like this. And what we see is that he trusted God, of course, but he prepared his men for battle. He prepared them. See, there's something in us that sometimes it says, oh, I'm just going to trust God for that. I'm going to trust God for that. And we don't do anything. And God's like, yeah, I don't think that's the way it's supposed to be. We do our part. God does his part. Look at Proverbs uh, 21, 31. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. The battle has to be, you have to prepare yourself, prepare what you can. So I say, like, uh, okay, you want a job. I don't know, just don't sit around waiting for God to plop a job in your lap. Go put out resumes. Prepare yourself. Uh, some of you are like, oh, I'm just not going to lock my doors. I'm just going to trust the Lord. No, you might want to lock your doors. You might even want to get an alarm system, okay? I mean, we're supposed to do things like, we're just, I mean, can God protect us? Yes, but he's like, I gave you a brain. Let's maybe use it. Some people are like, well, I'm just going to go apply for that job, but I don't have a college education. Well, here's the deal. You're not getting that job. Go get an education, some of you are like, well, I'm just going to, I didn't have time to study for my test, so I'm just going to pray and God will come through. Well, maybe not. The horse is prepared for the day of battle. Deliverance is of the Lord after you do your part. I was thinking about this. If I just got up here and had nothing to say, if I didn't prepare, you guys would, seriously, that would be bad. But the cool part about that is that I do this, I have no idea what it does in your hearts. I have no idea. Because everyone's different. There are different places in their life. And so I just talk, and I tell you what the Bible says, and then God does in your heart. I prepare, and then the battle's his in your life and, and whoever else listens to this. But see, here's what we need to know. We're supposed to do what we can and then trust God to do what we can't. And Abraham did that. He trained his men, and then he came up with a plan. Kind of like Leah did. This is a really funny story that nobody's going to get, just, just so you know that. So you're going to have to really think this through. I have this sweet little lady in New York. Her name is Eva. And every so often she calls me. Hi, Lisa, how you doing? Love your Bible study. She says, sometimes it takes me three or four hours to get your jokes, though. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I get that. Eva, this one is going to take you a long time. Okay, so watch this. Back in 1889, Sid and Leah's bull took sick. So they needed to go to the auction to buy a new bull. Sid couldn't leave the, fa the farm, so, so Leah gets on a train and she heads to the auction. The problem is the bidding was fierce and everyone was getting, you know, it was too high for her and there was one last bull. So she bids all the money that she has and she only has 10 cents left. So she gets on the train and she says, Conductor, I'm so sorry, I only have 10 cents. He said, you, you got to get off. 
She's like, please, can't you make an exception? He's like, nope, not at all. But there's a, a telegram down the street, so you can go down there and you can telegram your husband, tell him your problem. So she gets to the telegraph office and she, she said, how many, um, how, how many words can I send to my husband for a dime? That's all she had left. He said, one. Okay, so here's her word. Comfortable. Comfortable. Okay. <laughs> I don't even know why I found that funny, but I literally laughed hysterically. I was like, that's actually, really, who comes up with these things? I don't know. But anyway, problem solved, okay? <laughs> but the point is, is that Abraham just, he thought this through. He didn't just rush in with you know, guns blazing without knowing what he was going to do. He has a strategy, and I wonder how Sarah felt about this. I wonder if she's like, Abe, honey, this is a suicide mission. You know, you can't stand up to those kings. You're 75, for crying out loud. You're too old to go to war. You're a lover, not a fighter. You're a farmer, not a fighter. God has called you to be a saint, not a soldier, like you can just hear Sarah doing this. And then she adds this to it, I'm going to assume. This is my own assumption. Abe, look what Lot did to us. Why would you go save him and rescue him? He hurt us so bad. He moved the kids away from us. We never see him. He never comes over to hang out with us. He doesn't come to family dinner anymore. Like now he's in this wicked city. I just, why would you go save him? And I think we all actually have our own, they hurt us, why would we want to help them stories? Now, the Bible is pretty silent on why in the world would Abraham risk his life and the lives of his men for Lot. But I think it was because family was very important to him. Abraham probably felt really, really responsible for Lot. He brought him with him. Maybe he felt like this was his fault in a weird sense. But whatever the reason, I believe that Abraham knew something that God was trying to teach him all of these years. And it was this. He remembered God's promise to him. Now think this through. I am going to come up against four really, really bad, powerful kings. Why would he do that? Because I think he remembered God's promise. Abraham, I'm going to make a nation of you, your descendants. He knows this. If God's promise is true, then God will protect Abraham. See how that works? It's kind of awesome. He began to trust God. And I think that's the key to our Christian life. I think no matter what battle we're going through, we have to stop and say, okay, what has God promised me that I can stand on through this? Hebrews 13.5 says this, he's never going to leave us or forsake us. Whatever battle you're going through, you don't have to be like, oh, I'm going through this by myself. Nope, God's like, I'm never going to leave you. I'm always going to be by your side. In John 3.15, he promises us that if we trust Jesus, then you know what? We'll inherit eternal life. Okay, so the, what's the worst that could happen? You die, you're going to heaven. You see what I'm saying? Like, if we stand on the promises of God, then, then whatever battle we're going into doesn't look quite so bad. Romans 8, 28, all things work together for good. Stand on that. I don't know, this looks bad, it may turn out bad, but God's gonna use it for good. Like, if we just stand on the, I think that's what God was trying to get Abraham to do. Look at these verses, Isaiah 41, 10. Uh, so do not fear, I'm with you. Do not be dismayed, for I'm your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Deuteronomy 31.8, the Lord himself goes before you. He'll be with you. He will never leave you nor forsake you. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Do you see what happens when we start standing on the promises of God? Imagine walking through life like that. I don't have to be afraid of anything. And if something bad does happen or something tragic happens, I don't know, God's going to get me through it. He's going to sustain me. And if I die, oh well, I go right into his presence. I win. It's my theory. So knowing that, we can go forward. The divorce battle, the cancer battle, the marriage battle, the court battle, the kid battle, the relationship battle. Like whatever it is. Because it really, it kind of just doesn't really matter. It's like, I don't know, God, you're doing something in my life. I'm going to trust you with my life. So you're big and powerful. Protect me or take me home. I don't care. And I think Abraham finally got that. 
if, if God was going to keep his promise to Abraham about a nation being built through Abraham's kids, then God is going to have to keep Abraham alive, even against four wicked, evil kings from the east. And see, knowing and remembering that, I think Abraham suddenly went, wow, I can face anything. See, sometimes we forget that this world is not the end game. I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in the battle that we forget the big picture. What's going on with Abraham is this big picture. What's going on in your life is a big picture. Sometimes we get so caught up in the little mundane stuff that we forget that God is doing something big that we can't even see. So what happens here in verse 15, during the night, Abram divided his men to attack them and he routed them, pursuing them as far as Hobah, north of Damascus. Here's a little map here. Now they, they've gone past Israel and they've gone up into Syria where Damascus is. So Abram's going a long, long way. Um, and then verse 16 says this. Abraham, he recovered all the goods and brought back his relative Lot and his possessions together with the women and the other people. Abraham wins. Abraham wins this battle against these big four kings. And, and, and you go, what? How did that even happen? Here's how. Abraham has a plan and his powerful God on his side. And I think the enemy wasn't remotely expecting this. I don't know. Maybe the kings and all their troops were out drinking and partying that night. They had no idea that this was happening. Maybe God put them all to sleep like he did with Saul that one time with David. I don't know. But Abraham defeated this whole group of these kings of the east. And it seems unimaginable but because with such a small amount of men, I mean, think about all the people that were wiped out because of these kings of the east. Abraham and his army should have been wiped off the face of the map. But I don't think they would be because God was in the picture. And I think that Abraham knew that. And I think that he knew the magnitude of the army he was against. And when he won, he knew this. God alone should get all the credit. Not me, only God. It reminded me of another battle in the Bible with a man by the name of Gideon. Gideon's story begins with the Israelites, they were, they were disobeying God. Because of that, God disciplined them by allowing the Midianites, a bad group of people, to ruin their crops. So finally the Israelites were like, oh God, please save us. And God's like, okay. So he calls a man by the name of Gideon. And, and God says, Gideon, I want you to go and save the Israelites from this, the Midianites. And Gideon's like, What? I'm just like nobody. I'm just this little guy just eking it out every day. Like, I don't even come from a, a big clan. I'm, I'm, I'm just, it's, why, why me? God's like, I got this, but I need you to do it. So Gideon rallies 32,000 Israelites together to fight the Midianites. That's a pretty big army. This should work fine. But God says something so amazing. He's like, you know what? Your army's too big. Cut it down. Why? Look at this. The Lord said to Gideon, the people with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hand. Why? Lest Israel boast over me, saying, my own hand has saved me. He's saying, if you guys go with 32,000 men and you win, you're going to be like, we're so awesome. We did this. God's like, nope. You're going to do this with a small amount of people. And when you do, you're going to know that the battle was won because of me, not because of you. So, he goes to this. Therefore, he says to lower this army, he said, proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, whoever's fearful and trembling, let him return home and hurry away from Mount Gilead. So 22,000 of the people returned, 10,000 remain. So, so Gideon's like, all right, we went from 32,000 to 10,000, we're good to go. And, and God says this, no, people are still too many. So he comes up with this plan. He says, send them all down to the river. And, and the people that like get on their knees and, and cup their hands and, and drink from their hands, he separates them. Look at, um, look at verse five. Uh, so he brought the people down to the water. The Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set him by himself. 
Likewise, everyone who kneels down to drink. The number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was 300 men, but the rest of the people knelt down to drink the water. So God says, get rid of everyone but the 300 men. God's like, I am serious about you giving me the glory for what I can do. You need to know I am so incredibly powerful, I can do anything. And I was thinking about this. So many of us were waiting for God to come through. Miracles, healing, whatever it is that you're waiting for God. And so often, God waits to the very last minute. And we hate that. But now it all makes sense. Because if, if we're like, oh God, could you give me you know, a new house? And then suddenly, poof, the new house showed up. We wouldn't even think twice about it. But we're struggling. God, we really need this house. God, could you come through? And then there's two offers on the table and the other guy's offers more than yours. And you're like, oh God, you gotta come through. And then poof, you get it. And you realize it has nothing to do with you. It has everything to do with God. That's what God wants from us. He wants to say, look, I can do this. I'm powerful. Think about this with little David. David with a little, you know, a little slingshot and five little stones. He kills a giant. Like no, no one would ever be able to do that except God is that powerful to make sure that that happened. You have a hungry crowd of, of thousands of people that, that Jesus doesn't have any food from except a little tiny baby lunch. And God comes through and feeds him. Think of Moses and the staff. Raise your staff, the sea parts. What? Because God is that powerful. Think about Jesus. He's crucified. He laid in a tomb. Who would have ever thought God would raise him from the dead? And God comes through all the time after everyone has lost hope. The people standing at the Red Sea had no hope. The Israelites standing there with the Philistines and Goliath had no hope. The people starving and hungry had no hope. Everyone had lost hope. Miracles that only God could have made possible is what they were looking for. And the same is going on with Abraham. Who would have thought 318 men against four kings and their armies would ever stand a chance, but God can do anything. But the greatest part about this is Abram understood that he did nothing. It was all God. Look at verse 17. After Abram returned from defeating Ketelamir and the kings allied with him, he like, I can imagine him having this like, ticker tape parade. Think about this, when Apollo 11 came back from the moon, they had this big parade. I can imagine that with, with, with Abraham. He's standing there and, and all the people are coming back, Lot and all the goods and the women and, and son, all the families are just like, yay, we're so excited. And Abraham had a choice. He could have said, you know what? I am pretty awesome, aren't I? I'm, I did this. Look to me. I, I'm just like, I, I went to rescue them and, and I got them for you. But Abraham knew this. He didn't know it because it wasn't written yet, but you get the picture. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but man is tested by the praises he receives. Abraham wanted no praise whatsoever from anybody. He wanted them to know God was the one who did it. And I think how we take that into our life is we say, do we like portray to people like, oh, I'm so smart, I'm so wise, I'm so rich, I'm such a great warrior, whatever it is. Do you portray that? Or do you be like, ah, nah, I'm none of those things. But God has given me the ability to do whatever. Abraham reminds us that when people praise us for whatever reason, the first thing that should come out of our mouth is, it's not about me, it's about him. That, that's just it. So, after he comes back, guess who shows up? After Abram returned from defeating Ketelamir and the kings allied with him, the king of Sodom came out to meet him in the valley of Sheba, that is the king's valley. The wicked king of Sodom comes out to meet Abraham, thanking him, you know, but before the king of Sodom can even say a word, someone shows up. Look at this in verse 18. Then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now, this is amazing because Melchizedek, so many people don't understand him. If you read 10 commentaries, you're gonna get 10 different answers. 
it's really hard to figure out who this Melchizedek really is. And you'll see that in a second. It says Melchizedek is the king of Salem. So where is Salem? Well, we look at Psalm 76 too. His tent is in Salem, his dwelling place in Zion, which means Jerusalem. So it sounds like he is the king of Jerusalem. But think about this. Most kings coming to Abraham would be like a politician. High five, Abraham, can you like come, you know, tell people, you know, get me elected in Jerusalem again. Like, like politicians are like that. But this wasn't Melchizedek. Look at what he was. He was a priest of God most high. Abraham knew Melchizedek was serious. But we say a priest. Now, when we say that, we're not talking Catholic priests, so just know that. But priest is not something that, that we're used to because the priesthood hasn't even happened yet. Abraham will have Isaac. Isaac will have Jacob. Jacob has 12 sons. One of those sons, his name is Levi. The Levites are the ones that will be the the, the, the group that will be priests. They're the ones that will take care of the temple, the tabernacle, whatever. That's going to be their job to take care of all the worship, the law of Moses, all these things. That's their job. No, Abraham doesn't even have Isaac yet. And suddenly we see this priest show up named Melchizedek and we're like, what? The next time we hear about Melchizedek, we see it here in Psalm 110, 114. This particular psalm is talking about Jesus. It says, The Lord is sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Now, we're like, what? This isn't, Melchizedek has nothing to do with Israel's priesthood. This is about something so much bigger. Chara Donahue writes this. Genesis is filled with genealogies, but for Melchizedek, there's no record of his lineage before or after, Melchizedek was a priest in an order that had no beginning because Jesus is the order's greatest priest. It will also never end. The great news found here is that Jesus is not a Levitical priest for the Israelites, but a priest of the order of Melchizedek, meaning he is a priest for all. I mean, think how fascinating that is. It's like, it's, it's not like, oh, Jesus is just for the Jewish people. And it's not that. Jesus is for Everyone, and we see it all the way back in Genesis 14. Look at Hebrews. Hebrews talks about this. Hebrews 7. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave tenth part of, of all, being translated the king of righteousness, and then also king of Salem, meaning king of peace. Here's what it says about Melchizedek without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of days, but made like the Son of God, remains a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was to whom the patriarch Abraham gave a tenth of the spoils. It's so weird. Now, the thing is, is it's pointing to Jesus. Remember, Jesus doesn't have an end or a beginning. I mean, the way we, we look at it. And and. Jesus is our high priest. So somehow this whole order of Melchizedek has something to do with Jesus being this priest over everyone, high priest. We don't have to sacrifice our sins anymore by goats or whatever. He's our high priest now. But we see it all the way back at the beginning of Genesis. It's so fascinating. Verse 18, then Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. All the way back in Genesis, we see bread and wine. Jesus used bread and wine to remember you know, communion, to remember his body and blood. But we see it all the way back here in Genesis. The first thing Melchizedek brings is that. Verse 18 goes on and says, He was a priest of God Most High. He blessed Abram, saying, Blessed be Abram by God Most High, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, here you go, who delivered your enemies into your hand. Melchizedek wanted to remind Abraham it was God who did that. Not you, Abraham, God. And Abraham gave him a tenth of everything. Now that's fascinating in itself. Because think about it, where do we get this whole idea of give 10%? It really comes from the law. When Moses comes down with the law, it's like you give a tenth to this, blah, 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 you tie this, the Pharisees and everyone tie. But where did that come? This is before the law even ever even showed up. But Abraham wanted to give back to Melchizedek and he gave him a tenth. And that doesn't mean, that just means that's what was in his heart. 
The giving now isn't so much you should give 10%. It's like you need to give what's in your heart. And if you can afford 50%, you need to give that. If you can afford 1%, then you need to give that. It's not a law any longer. It's, it's, it's a heart thing. And this was in Abram's heart to give 10%. And then the king of Sodom speaks. The king of Sodom said to Abram, give me the people and keep the goods for yourself. In other words, good job, Abram. Thank you so much. Let my people, you know, come back to my wicked city. Your nephew can come back to my wicked city. But you know what? You can keep everything else. But look what Abram says. But Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have raised my hand to the Lord, God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and I have taken an oath that I will accept nothing belonging to you, not even a thread or the thong of a sandal, so that you will never be able to say, I made Abraham rich. I will accept nothing but what my men have eaten and the share that belongs to the men who went with me to Asner, Eshkel, and Mamre. Let them have their share. And I love how the story ends. It's all about God. Everything is about him. He will supply our needs. He will, he will win our battles for us. We do our part. He does his part. We trust him to do whatever. I don't need anything from a wicked king. God gets credit for anything that comes into my life, good or bad, believe it or not. And see, that's how I want to end today. This chapter is just a reminder to me of how powerful God is. He can do anything, like win a war with something really small, like a small, tiny army of 318 men. He can do anything. But most of us don't know that because we haven't spent the time to get to know this awesome, powerful God. And if we want to know him so well, we're going to need to open our Bible and read stories just like we read today about this battle, about the Midianites, about Gideon, all of these. This is important to read the Bible. And then what happens is our faith just grows leaps and bounds. I can honestly tell you that there's nothing in my life that I would ever consider taking credit for, ever. Job, credentials, family, marriage, whatever, ministry, nothing. This ministry has nothing to do with me, and I know that. I get up here and do this because I think God has given me a gift to teach. That's what I'm supposed to do. But beyond that, I, I, I don't, this isn't my deal. And God can stop this any day he wants, and I know that too. It's all about him. And I think this, this lesson today is a reminder that no matter who we are and what we have and what we do, everything needs to go back to this powerful, awesome God. Father, thank you so much for this story. I didn't realize we could take a war in the Bible and, and suddenly see you as being so amazing and big and powerful, and I'm so thankful for this. And it was just a great reminder this week to me that I need to just remember you can do anything. I don't have to worry about anything. And I pray for those today that are going through really difficult struggles that they stop and they say, wait a minute, God, you can do this. You can do whatever needs to be done in my life. We surrender that to you. God, thank you for all you do for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a good day.